Our next uh, public investment plan is Steering Clear, a driver's license diversion program. And uh, Don Diener, who is our public defender, is going to kick us off. You'll have seven minutes to make your case, seven minutes for questions. I know that you brought with you a panel. If you have time, you're welcome to introduce them. But before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to some of the other elected officials who I know have joined us. We have uh, Council Member uh, Russ Pulley, who is behind me. We have uh, uh, Circuit Court Clerk Ricky Rooker. We also have Juvenile Court Clerk. David Smith, and I think, and of course, we've got Judge Bell up here, and I think that's it. So we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Meet Kevin, a military veteran who ran into red tape trying to get his commercial driver's license reinstated and went to Nashville Workforce Development at Jump for help. He was making progress in a rehab program and needed to work, but he couldn't without his license. Workforce Development helped him cut through the red tape, then paid his reinstatement fee when he couldn't. Two days later, Kevin was working, and he's worked ever since. After struggling with addiction, he's been 20 months sober, he's got his own car, and he's repaid workforce development. Having his license allowed him to stay on the right track, and that makes Nashville better. Ms. Brown is a 42-year-old Nashvilleian who can't remember how she lost her license 20 years ago. But she knows there are times when our public transportation and her friends and family can't get her everywhere she needs to be when she needs to be there. She's raising her four-year-old niece, she's earning $300 a week at a local restaurant, and she's barely getting by in her Nashville. In the last two years, she's been cited three times for driving on a suspended license. She came to the public defender's office because she wanted her license, but she can't afford the costs she owes on top of the $1,200 reinstatement fee. She and Nashville would be better if she had her license. And there are thousands more stories in Nashville like these. People who've lost their license only to find they can't afford to get it back or can't navigate the complicated process created by our laws. The truth is there is very little connection today between who can legally drive and public safety. Instead, it's mostly about money. Licenses are suspended for all kinds of reasons, including unpaid traffic tickets, unpaid child support, and unpaid court costs. And who feels the impact of these laws the most? The poor, who often get trapped in a never-ending cycle of debt. What am I talking about? Well, imagine the 22-year-old Ms. Brown today, licensed and working a minimum wage job. She gets a speeding, which for her, a speeding ticket, which for her costs more than a day's wages. She's something she just can't afford. When she doesn't pay the ticket, the cost triples. And not long after, her license gets suspended. A few months later, she's driving to work when police stop her for a broken taillight. This time, she's cited for driving on a suspended license. She gets the case dismissed by doing a $90 class, but now she's got a new court cost bill. Plus, she still owes her tripled traffic ticket and her state reinstatement fee. In Nashville, cases like these are clogging our courts. In 2015, over 36,000 defendants in Nashville received a state citation for a license offense. In two-thirds of those cases, 24,000, that was the only charge they faced. That averages out to 114 cases per court day, more than enough to produce a court system that operates much like a conveyor belt to nowhere. Here's how it works now. Our Ms. Brown drives on a suspended license, gets stopped by police, and gets a criminal citation. A few weeks later, she reports to the Birch Building, where the sheriff books her on the charge, takes her mugshot, her fingerprints, and creates her arrest record. From there, the clerk creates a file and hands that off to the district attorney. The DA reviews the charge, her criminal history, and makes a plea offer, often some kind of informal diversion, like class or community service work. In some cases, the public defender is involved, or court interpreters, and in all cases, the General Sessions Court is involved, taking guilty pleas, monitoring diversions, presiding over return court dates. When the case ends, the clerk and the collection agency have to touch the case again, trying to collect the costs. And if Ms. Brown can't pay them, well, she still has no license, and she owes more money. If she seeks help now, at least three of these agencies will likely have to touch the case again. Now 
Nashville's criminal justice leaders and our concerned citizens see this process doesn't help anyone. We know what would help is a problem-solving approach that cuts down on court involvement and gets people back to work and legally driving. We call that steering clear. Under this concept, when our Miss Brown gets cited by police, she doesn't go on the conveyor belt to nowhere. Instead, she goes to the steering clear office, where staff will identify whether she is eligible to get her license, and if she is, they will do what it takes to help her do that, much like workforce development did for Kevin. Meanwhile, her booking is deferred, and when she gets her license, the criminal charge against her is simply withdrawn, allowing her to avoid contact with the criminal justice system entirely and vice versa. If Ms. Brown can't get her license, but her driving doesn't pose a public safety risk, Steering Clear will offer her a chance to do something else like community service work in exchange for having her charge withdrawn. And if Ms. Brown falls into the small category of people whose driving creates a concern for public safety, Steering Clear will refer her back to the traditional courthouse model. Why do we think this will work? Well, one reason is the model in Wisconsin called the Driver's License Center for Driver's License Recovery and Employability. It's a public-private partnership, and three years in, they had positive results. They had a 57% driver's license recovery rate, 75% of their clients were in their 20s and 30s, 100% of them were in poverty. It's clear that driver's license is critical to positive employment options. The benefits of this solution are obvious. It is more efficient with improved outcomes. So what do we need? Steering Clear program, we ask, we estimate needing six employees for screening, monitoring, and case management, a central office space close to downtown and large enough to accommodate the traffic. We'd like to explore the possibility of a public-private partnership and a launch date about a year from now, enough time to convert the concept into a detailed reality. Finally, we see Steering Clear becoming a proactive center serving those in our recovery and reentry communities, where folks are already know how important a driver's license is to creating better futures and a better Nashville for everyone. Thank you. quick shout out. I know Howard Gentry is also behind me, Howard. I see you back there. Thank you for being here. Um, ooh, panelists. There's two items I want to clarify whether they're in this budget or not. The uh, physical office space that you're speaking about, is that The physical office, office space is not. And I think that we would still want to talk about whether or not there is something we could utilize in a private partnership as part of the public-private partnership. Uh, there may be another facility that Metro has that's close to the courthouse or space there, but there may also be a private partner who would have space close that would work as well. There's also a, a $250,000 participant fee listed. Could you explain that in addition to the FTE so I understand? Sure. I, I think that we do want to consider the possibility that for clients who do come in, individuals who do receive a citation and perhaps do have financial means to, to pay for some uh, services provided, charging a fee. I think we want to be careful with that, though, because I think you can spend a lot of time and resources screening for that and really not get much return on investment. So should we just discount that as part of the proposal? I think that it's it's something that we would want to talk about as part of the details, but it was an estimate that we provided really just to kind of as a place marker. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Rich? It seems like you would really have two steps here. The first is a year of study to see the best approach, and then followed by the hiring of some staff so I'm just making sure I understand this right it seems like the um, the study may say we need eight people it may say we need four people we'll figure that out but you would have all the partners listed here in that collaborative effort to try to determine over the next period of time however long it takes sure and I think we feel like uh, 
we have a lot of participation and uh, really great support by all the criminal justice agencies who want to make this work. I think there are, because you're dealing with the, you know, why are people's licenses suspended and figuring out rules and policies that everybody could follow so there's not a whole lot of discretion somewhere in this office. So we thought it would take about a year to get all of those steps in place. You'd probably need new forms. You'd probably you know, need to get the word out about the program. And so that's the estimate we gave. And our estimate of six full-time employees is based, frankly, on the amount of individuals that are com the 24,000 number um, and the number of individuals that the one employee in our office who does driver's license assistance is able to help on an average weekly basis. I mean, I'm you know, just playing budget director here for a second. Could, is there not some consolidation of existing operations that could be consumed into some of those six that as you mitigate uh, duties of others, that's stuff that could be studied over the next year, so I won't would, yes. can say, but you know, functions that are now being done by X could roll into this new, new office as I well. I think there is potential for that. Yeah. So, if, for instance, if the sheriff's office has four individuals that are booking individuals in at the 1A docket, and we can reduce traffic to 1A, we may be able to take one of those employees and staff them at the somewhere else. Right, or, yeah. So there about. might be some right. cost yeah. savings. Yeah. Yes. Good. Can I ask you about the Wisconsin model? Sure. And you specifically said they had a P3, you know, public-private partnership. Yeah. Who did they partner with? So they are they have a municipal court system as well as like a county state government system, and then they have a legal services corporation that they are partnering with, as well as uh, the same kinds of organizations that we saw at the beginning here. Places like Room in the Inn, Martha O'Brien, um, Jump, the workforce development at Jump, uh, Urban Housing, the, the Re So it's lots of community agencies, the, the reentry and recovery communities are a lot of the private organizations they're partnering okay. with. Is Legal Aid on your list up there? Legal Aid is not, but that's my fault. That's somebody I haven't reached out to yet as we have been trying to pull this all together. Okay. Any additional questions from panelists? So Michael? Works. The first year's study, which costs nothing, did this would kick in in the 17-18 with an estimated six FTEs, and that would be an annual cost thereafter. Yes. Thank you. I want to make sure. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all for being here. We really uh, to, can I, do I have any time? I can introduce the folks who are yes, here. Yes, please. You have time. All right. I have time. So we have Judge Bell from General Sessions Court. We have Amy Hunter from the uh, from the DA's office. We have Stephanie Harris from Nashville Workforce Development at Jump. We have Alfred DeGraff and Reed from the Criminal Court Clerk's Office. In the audience, I know we have Howard Gentry. We have Judge Calloway. Uh, we have some private individuals who have joined us and who are very interested in this. Uh, from NOAA, we have Mike Hodge and Pat Halper. We have Sally Levine with the Driver's License Reinstatement Fund. We have uh, Project Return represented. We have Marsha Edwards with Martha O'Brien. Charlie Strobel with Room in the Inn. Linda Leathers with The Next Door. And we have Reverend James Thomas from the Jefferson Street Baptist Church. Uh, and I think we have Reverend Frank Gordon here from the Missionary Baptist State Convention of Tennessee. And then we have a whole lot of public defenders. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and they, they see, they see these folks day in, day out coming through court, and this is important to them, and it's important to the clients of our office. So I appreciate you all listening. Great. And hopefully funding this. Thank you so much. We appreciate you all for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you.